Hello guys, welcome to the first episode of Top Wine List. My name is Sebastian, I'm gonna be your host. And if you're watching this video, you probably know me already. As you probably know, I'm from Argentina. I'm actually in Argentina right now. I've been here for the last three months. I came over mid-February to work on a project, but unfortunately, everything, it got canceled. And now, airports are only going to start working in September. So, I'm gonna be having a lot of free time and most of you guys in the States and America have been asking me to do a couple of videos, giving out some, you know, wine recommendations and these kind of things to talk more about wine. So now I have a lot of free time, no more excuses. And I, and I decided to, you know, to give it a try. The concept of the show is going to be very simple. I'm going to put together a list of interesting things that I think you need to know about wine. And then I'm going to share it with you. And yes, I'm going to be giving one recommendations. I'm going to tell you what kind of wines you should have, what kind of wines you should try, but also I want to talk about things in general. I want to talk about things surrounding the world of wine, such as food, wine, you know, wine pairings, travel, chemistry, winemaking, all these kind of things that I find very interesting um, and I think you will find them also. I want you to learn more about wine in an interesting, in a relaxed, in an easy way. I promise you I'm going to keep it very casual, very chill. This is not gonna be a video for a expert sommelier or, or for, for, a, for a wine super connoisseur. So, after all the formal announcement has been made, what do you think if we jump into today's list? We have six different things that you can learn while you learn about wine. Number one, it's history. And I'm talking about a lot of history. You see, we beautiful human beings we have been very busy drinking wine for the last maybe eight, ten thousand 10,000 years. Together with water, beer, and probably breast milk, wine is one of the oldest beverages in the world. There is plenty of archaeological evidence of wine fermentation found at sites in China, Georgia, and other places. But the earliest evidence of a steady production of wine was found in Armenia. Yes, the oldest known winery was discovered inside a cave, in a site now known as the Areni One. Caretaker Armenak Milkanyan has kept an eye on this cave complex for seven years. He never imagined this site, near the Armenian village of Arani and known by locals as the Bird's Cave, would turn out to be a national landmark. But that was before an international team of archaeologists made a surprising discovery this year the world's oldest wine press. Archaeologists from Armenia, Ireland and the United States found clay vessels for crushing grapes and fermenting and preserving their juice. They also identified grape seeds more than 6,000 years old, evidence people in this region have been producing wine for more than six millennia. But ancient history, it's just the beginning. After viticulture was spread by the Romans throughout Europe, eventually the medieval period came. During this time, wine was crucial, mainly because of the importance on the celebration of the Catholic Mass. Now, the Benedictine monks became one of the largest producers of wine in Germany and France, with vineyards in Bordeaux, Burgundy and Champagne. And yes, Dom Perignon was in fact a Benedictine monk. And after this point, it's clearly evident that the history of wine is totally entangled with human history itself. For example, the answers to why we have, why we have vineyards in America, South Africa, Australia or New Zealand are all found in the history and development of those countries. Other questions such as why are we grafting European vines into American rootstock at the time of planting a vineyard well, they can be answered by analyzing the history of Phylloxera, a tiny louse that brought widespread destruction to all the vineyards in Europe and farther away, you know, in the late 19th century. The 1855 classification of Bordeaux, prohibition, economic depression, world wars, and the judgment of Paris back in 1976 are all historical events that have shaped the wine industry as we know it. So, if you want to learn about wine, my friends, get ready because you're going to have to dive a lot into history as well. Second thing that you can learn while you learn about wine, it's geography. 
If you love wine, if you drink wine, if you're a wine lover, sooner or later, at one point, you're gonna try to answer the question, why? Why this wine tastes the way it does? And the answer is, we don't know exactly why or what makes a wine, or if there's only one thing that makes a wine so unique. What we do know is that there are a lot of external geographical factors that can actually change the way a wine tastes. To name a few, the type of soil where the vines are grown, it's important. The overall climate of a region, it's important. The altitude where that vineyard is planted and the proximity of the sea, or no sea at all, are all factors that can influence how a wine tastes. So picture this, you're at home watching TV, maybe you're watching, I don't know, Tiger King, maybe you're watching Michael's Jordan Last Dance, and all of a sudden you decide to have some wine. How about a bottle of Chablis? Now, after you, well, successfully opened that bottle of wine, you drink it and you enjoy it so much that now you want to read more about this wine. So, you grab your cell phone, you type Chablis, and all of a sudden you're learning all about Kimmer region, a very old and unique type of soil that is believed to comfort Chablis, its unique purity and sophisticated mineral taste. And of course, if we talk about geography, at some point, we're gonna be looking at maps. And this is where things can get very, very interesting. Because if you grab a bottle of wine, any bottle of wine for that matter, eventually you will find somewhere on the label an indication of its origin. Now, this can be the name of a place as big as a country or as small as a vineyard. Believe me, there are some wine regions that can make this very tricky. Let's talk about Burgundy, for example. In Burgundy, you have 33 different vineyards with 33 different names classified as Grand Cru. And that's the maximum quality classification that you get in the region. So that means if you buy any bottle of wine that comes from a Grand Cru vineyard, you're getting the best of the best and probably spending much more money compared to if you were getting a bottle of wine from a Premier Cru vineyard. The problem though, is that in Burgundy, there are 585 vineyards classified as Premier Cru. So without a map, it's almost impossible to see where one vineyard starts and the other vineyard ends. The third thing that you can learn while you learn about wine is languages. As you have probably already noticed, I have a very pretty accent. And that's because I am from Argentina and we speak Spanish. But I've been working in the wine industry for the last eight to 10 years. I can also speak a little French. I can understand a little Portuguese. I can mumble maybe some Italian and some German. And that makes sense because all of those countries, France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, they're all major wine producers. French in particular is what you see everywhere when it comes to the world of wine. Most of all international grape varieties have a French origin. Take for example, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Semillon. There is also a lot of other words that you can see related to the vineyard, related to the winemaking process, and all of those words are mostly exclusively French. Terms such as prestige cuvée, vendage tardive, and élevage are all common words found when you read about wine. And the same thing applies for Italian, with words such as appassimento, for example, which is a very unique method of drying grapes used on the making of the wine Amarone della Val Policella. But things can get really tricky when it comes to other wine countries such as Greece or Hungary, both very famous for producing great wine, but also famous for giving us words such as uh, The best red variety of, of Greece is called Xinomavro. Greek great variety called Ayorgitico. Or in the case of Hungary, One of the most famous Hungarian wine is probably Tokai, which is made of Asusodot Sölö Semek. And yes, it might be difficult to remember these words or even to pronounce them properly. And believe me, very few people can actually pronounce these words properly. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter because you have the sommelier, which is right there to help you, which brings us to thing number four. Food. Or even better, gastronomy. 
because when you learn about wine, you also get to learn about that very special art of preparing and serving rich or delicate and appetizing food. And this can be no surprise because wine loves food. And this might be the reason why so many people who like wine end up learning a lot about cooking. Take food and wine pairing, for example. When sommeliers have to find a wine for a dish, it's not only helpful to know its ingredients, but also the cooking methods of that specific recipe. And this also applies for people at home. Imagine you invited people for dinner. You got an amazing bottle of Monsanto Chianti Classico, but you have no idea what kind of food goes well with that wine. Well, a very easy approach to food and wine pairing is to think local meaning the one made in a region generally goes well with food from the same area. So, you decide to read more about Chianti, Tuscany, and boom, you find the perfect recipe, Tagliatelle al Tartufo. And you don't stop there. Now you learn about truffles and all the other Italian wines that can go well with truffle, such as Barolo and Brunello di Montalcino. And all of a sudden, now you want to travel to Italy just to have dinner at Osteria Francescana. And why? Well, because while you were learning about Italian food, you also learned about this crazy Italian genius called Massimo Bottura, who owns one of only 11 restaurants with three Michelin stars in the country. And of course, you want to go there because now you know a lot about food and about wine. Number five on our list of things you can learn while you learn about wine is chemistry. And that's because from a chemical point of view, wine is a solution. Now, it might not be the solution to your love problems. This means that wine is simply a combination of 98% alcohol, water, and a 2% combination of sugar, acid, pigments, aroma compounds, and another phenolic component. That 2%, it can seem small, but it can make all the difference between a nasty bottle of wine and the best bottle of wine that you're gonna drink in your life. That's the reason why winemakers, for example, study at university subjects such as gray anatomy or wine microbiology. Actually, it's funny because grape anatomy sounds like Grey's anatomy. <laughs> can you imagine uh, grapes solving a, a misery murder? <laughs> But let's be honest, we are not winemakers. We're just simply wine lovers, we're simply wine drinkers, but still, a little bit of chemistry, it can help you to understand the reasons why a Chardonnay is buttery or the effects that sulfates, for example, have in winemaking. Another good example are the methoxypyrcins, a group of compounds which are responsible for the very characteristic green, herbaceous, or even vegetal aromas of Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and some other Bordeaux variety wines. On the other hand, 2463 chloroanisole, or TCA for short, it's the nasty chemical responsible for the aromas of moldy newspaper, wet dog, or damp basement that you can find in corked wine. So, regardless whatever is your relationship with chemistry, maybe you hate it, maybe you don't, it really doesn't matter, because if you learn about wine, you will most certainly learn about chemistry too. And last but not least, of the things that you can learn while you learn about wines, we have a number six, economy. Imagine owning a vineyard, having a winery, making 5,000 cases of wine a year, sipping some wine in the beautiful Nap Valley, rubbing elbows with neighbors such as Francis Ford Coppola and Yao Ming. Sounds good, right? Well, yes, but you gotta have deep pockets. Consider this. The price of one acre on a primary location in Nap Valley, such as St. Helena, it will cost you $400,000, and that's just one acre of land. Then you need to plant some vines on it, you need to hire people to manage the vineyard and make the wine, a place to build your winery, winemaking equipment, and oak barrels. Add everything up, and you're looking at something like a $9 million investment. Now let's say that you don't want to make the wine, you just want to sell it. Then things can be easier, right? Well, not entirely. Because even though the US wine industry is worth more than $72 billion, you will still have to deal with the three tires distribution system, which is a very, very complicated system that goes back to the repeal of prohibition in 1933. The three tires involved in the system are the supplier, it could be a winery or importer, 
a distributor, generally a wholesaler, and retailer, supermarkets, wine shops, and restaurants. And even though this was done originally with the good intention of promoting fair market practices, laws around distribution and consumption of alcohol are still notoriously complex and different from state to state, resulting in most cases with wine being more expensive for the final consumer, as each additional step in distribution adds a layer of pricing to the final product. Let me give you an example. A bottle of wine that sells in a restaurant wine list for $100 was probably bought from the distributor for something around $35. They purchased the wine from the winery for maybe $25, and the cost to make that wine was probably something between $12 or $15. And you must be wondering, well, how about those bottles of wine like Chateau Latour or a bottle of Domaine de la Romane Conti, which can be as expensive as $20,000 per bottle? Why are those wines so expensive? Well, because they can. You see, in those particular cases, wine falls under the category of luxury. That means that the production cost of that wine are not just the whole story, because the perceived value that the market has on those wines is going to affect the price that people is willing to pay for them. Now, reputation, scarcity, and supply and demand can also make a wine more expensive or cheaper. News for wine lovers. The price of wine is expected to drop to its lowest since 2016. An annual report predicts wine consumers will enjoy the best wine retail values in 20 years. More efficient harvesting methods combined with a decreased demand for wine means drinkers can expect a better deal for maybe as long as three years. But now that you have learned more about wine and economy, I am sure that next time you go to your local wine shop to buy a bottle of wine, you will find a much more better value. And that, my friends, it's a wrap. If you made it to the end of this video, congratulations, you are actually amazing. Guys, as you can see, I'm not a video expert. I'm not a YouTuber. Um, I don't have any special background or, or fancy lights. I'm recording all these videos with my cell phone. Um, so I'm doing all this by myself. So if you will really want to support me, please subscribe and please tell your friends, tell your family, share this video on Facebook, share this video, um, you know, with any wine lover that you know. And please leave a comment down below uh, so I can read what do you want to learn about wine. I promise you I'm going to make an interesting list. I can tell you that the second episode is going to be about wine recommendations. I'm going to give out five of my favorite wines that you can buy in America. And if you guys live somewhere else, please let me know. And I promise you I'm going to do the homework and I'm going to create an interesting um, story about that. That being said, thank you so much for watching. Um, stay safe. A lot of crazy things going on, especially in America. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.